Dobrý večer. Good evening. Uh, my name is Prem Fotala. I'm the director of the Czech Center. I'm really uh, delighted to see so many of you here uh, this, this evening. Did you know, by the way, that uh, if you still fly with the Czech Airlines and you landed in Prague, they started to play Smetana's uh, Voltava on the board. Unfortunately, not that many planes with the Czech Airlines. Uh, the, the British, I think, do not play that. Uh, but anyhow, we have such a rare opportunity uh, to celebrate this evening the bicentenary anniversary of a birth uh, of Bedřich Smetana, one of the greatest uh, classical music uh, composers. So if you think about it, there are not that really uh, many personalities that we would remind ourselves for, for many, many centuries. And it's interesting, if we do, so the personalities are usually uh, composers of uh, classical classical music, <laughs> and uh, in in fact, uh, the Smetana's anniversary was the reason the author of uh, the year of Czech music, which is celebrated worldwide by the Czech centers, embassy, and many other organizations and institutions, uh, of course, in the Czech Republic. Uh, so in the United Kingdom, uh, we have teamed up with a number of partners and festivals, to, uh, such as the Leamington Music Festival, Newberry uh, Spring Festival, Proms, where you could hear uh, Czech music and the Czech uh, musicians. Also in early May, uh, some of you might know, we will gonna have a Kukal uh, Quartet here uh, playing concert at the Czech, uh, Czech Embassy, so you're, you're welcome. And uh, other generous uh, jazz and music, uh, jazz and blues, will be in the main uh, focus in Edinburgh and the Jazz and Blues Festival there in early July. And we're going to have a number of musical performances also in the autumn, so something to really look, look forward. But back to this evening. Uh, to commemorate Smetana's uh, anniversary, we have really assembled quite distinguished panel uh, of experts to, uh, to discuss and explore uh, Smetana's legacy, his music, uh, and his life. And I'm very delighted uh, that we're going to be joined this evening. Uh, and let me start with our guest uh, lady uh, by, by Sandra Bergmanova. <laughs> who is the director of Bedrick Smetana uh, Museum in Prague, which is part of the National uh, Museum. Uh, also, I'd like to introduce Jan Smachny, who is a uh, leading expert on the Czech music, uh, Professor Emeritus at the uh, Queen's University, Belfast. <laughs> Thomas Yerman, musicologist and composer, recently written a research paper uh, on Smetana that will be published later this year. Uh, so, Thomas. <laughs> and Tomasz uh, Hanus, uh, music director uh, of the Welsh National Opera, who is going to join us uh, through Zoom. I think we might see him there all, all, already. Uh, he's in Brno, uh, working and conducting the new uh, production of Dalibor in, in, in Brno. Good evening. And last but not least, I'm very pleased that the panel will be chaired uh, by John uh, Ellison, a really, uh, renowned musical critic and editor of the opera magazine. Thank you. So before I turn the floor to our uh, panelists, uh, I really would like to thank uh, our partner of this evening, which is the Czech Tourism. And now I'd like to invite here uh, for a few welcome words uh, the head of, of the office here, uh, Katarzyna Hobbs. Thank you, Premek. Dear ladies and gentlemen, 
It's my great pleasure to welcome you as well here today uh, on behalf of Czech Tourism. My name is Espramekse Katarina Hobbs. I'm the director of Czech Tourism Authority representing the travel and tourism sector for the United Kingdom and Ireland. Today we are diving into the world of Czech musical heritage, shining a spotlight on the incredible legacy of Bedřich Smetana on his 200th birthday. We are taking a deep dive into what makes the Czech music special and why it's such a big deal for a tourism in general, tourism industry in general. Teaming up with Czech Center, that we want to really thank you as well that we were allowed to team up with you, to Renata and Przemek. We are excited to show off the Czech Republic as the ultimate destination for music lovers. Think about it. We've got the birthday places and birthplaces of regend legendary classical music figures just like Smetana in Litomyshl, which is only an hour away from Prague that you probably didn't even know. This place isn't just a spot on the map, it is a hot spot for a music buff, giving you a peek into um, a life of the musical genius who called this place his home. Imagine the cobbled streets with the UNESCO protected chateau in the center that allows you to expire and experience this living history. As Przemek mentioned, 2024, it's the year of the Czech music, and we would love to invite you to the Czech Republic to explore other vibrant cities, beautiful regions, the history of a music as rich as Czech hearty traditional cuisine. Today, we might not gonna have a live performances, but it's about celebrating the lasting impact of classical music on our culture. We certainly hope you will enjoy today's evening and soon visit the Czech Republic and experience it for yourself. Thank you and enjoy your evening. Thank you very much, Katarina, for the kind words. And without any further ado, uh, lady and gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you this evening. Um, I was also very fortunate about a month ago to go to the opening night of Dalibor, uh, one of Smetana's great operas in Brno, conducted by one of our panelists tonight, uh, Tomasz Hanus. And um, so I thought we should actually start with you, Tomasz, for a moment. Uh, I find it's always good to start with conductors. Um, and um, I know it's slightly difficult by Zoom joining us, but please don't be shy. Again, I don't think many conductors are shy, so please uh, just interrupt us when you, when, when you feel like it. Um, what I really want to ask you about is not quite so much about Dalibor, though maybe we'll come to this, this wonderful production in Brno, but actually, um, I know that last year you took the Welsh National Opera Orchestra uh, to the Prague Spring Festival to play Mar Vlast, which was really, you know, a, a very big deal indeed. Could you tell us a little bit about your work in with the Welsh National Orchestra doing Smetana and especially that event in Prague? Thank you very much. Um, Smetana is basically not a very well-known composer internationally uh, from many points of view, or at least not as much as we would wish to have. And uh, so uh, for the Welsh National Opera, it's been really the first time after many, many years uh, that uh, Mavlast uh, was performed in Cardiff first in January and then in Prague in May as the opening performance on, of the Prague Spring Festival. Um, we discovered that there was, uh, we found a very old uh, program, a, a brochure of, of a concert with uh, Charles McCarras, but it was really deep, it's ago, like 30 years or more. A very yellow, <laughs> yellow old paper. Um, I must say that uh, the reaction of musicians on Smetana's music is amazing. I, I, I must say, uh, I saw the faces of uh, the musicians of Welsh National Opera, how they were feeling 
about about uh, getting deep into into this genius music and and uh, I, I I I'm convinced and I think this is the outcome on our side that Smetana became one of their favorite composers. They really loved to do it and they they can't wait playing Dalibor, which we should do because it's done as a co-production of of both of the opera houses, Cardiff and Brno. I, I can continue, but I think no, you, you can ask well, some, some thank more Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to this. Um, one thing I want to do before we really uh, dive in um, deep into Smetna especially is just to remind you all because there's no reason why you should all be experts in Czech music just very very briefly in the barest outline of where Smetna fits in of course you might have gathered by now that he was born 200 years ago this month um, and he's really the most senior member of what are often thought of the big four Czech composers, Smetana, Vorjak, and Janacek, and Martinu. But of course, Czech music didn't begin with, with him and it didn't end with these four. Um, can, I'm just trying not to echo too much. Um, there were wonderful Czech composers in the 18th century and we, we shouldn't forget all the other composers that followed Smetana. I'm thinking of people who we might know by name but don't get enough chances to hear. Fibish, Furster, Novak, Suk, and so on and so forth. Kapralova, Ullmann, Haas. You know, and maybe I'll get into trouble, but talking about Czech composers, I should also mention Mahler. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, this is the context in which we're going to be talking tonight. The, the Czech lands are incredibly rich in composers, probably more than, have more great composers than any other country per square mile. And, um, uh, this is why we want to concentrate a little bit on, on, on Smetana. But since we started with talking about uh, the Welsh National Opera Orchestra playing and loving Smetana so much, and before we really take this, uh, shall we say, the, the, the Czech tourist trail and, and, and go, to the Czech, uh, go to the Czech lands, I think it's very interesting to reflect for a moment on perhaps on why, why you are all here tonight, because Czech music has a great following in Britain. There's no question about that. And this is something I would like to uh, ask the panel about in a moment. I mean, ever since Vorjak's visits to England, um, uh, the music has been, uh, English have been very receptive to his music. And of course, there's a big and distinguished history of young Czech operas as well here. So before we open this to the panel, I'd just like to read you a little short sentence or two from, a, from an interview I did with Libor Peshek some years ago when I asked him about this and he said, I understand the appeal of Czech music in Britain. They're taught to keep their emotions under wraps. The Brits are very emotional and they welcome every opportunity to live these emotions through music. This may be the basis of the success of Vorjak, whose music sometimes has almost too much emotion. I think as the only Brit on the panel I should turn first to, to Jan Smatchny and also um, a, a Dvorak, passionate about Dvorak and immersed in Dvorak. How do you, do you feel about the connections between Czech music and, and, and audiences here in the UK? I think audiences here are just so receptive to it and I, I think uh, Part of the problem is that um, concert planners get very lazy and so they like to trot out really well-known pieces like Nova, uh, New World Symphony, Cello Concerto, those pieces. But as soon as they actually try something a little bit different, another symphony by Dvořák, maybe the Piano Concerto, maybe some of the choral music, all of a sudden they find they have expanded their audience in uh, an extraordinary kind of way. I, I suspect the same is true of Smetana. I mean, Bartow Bride obviously is a piece that everybody knows, everybody loves, everybody feels welcomed into. And also um, Marvelous, but mostly um, Vultava. 
play some more of these things and I'm sure you will actually seduce your audiences into enjoying a much bigger range. And it doesn't stop with Smetana, it doesn't stop with Dvořák. I mean, Tomášek, um, all kinds of composers that could say so much to us uh, and yet we don't have an opportunity to hear them. Uh, and the, the British audiences are great because they love novelty. They always did. I mean, Dvořák was the great novelty of the 1880s and he stuck with them. They carried on performing his choral music well into the 20th century, much, much more so than we do now. Um, just, just go back to that open receptiveness that I'm sure um, will, will uh, have us all listening to a greater variety of these composers. Thank you. And Sandra, do you, I don't know whether you um, keep uh, tabs on what nationalities are visiting the museum, but are there a lot of British visitors to the museum, the Smetana Museum in Prague, <coughs> noticeably? I don't think so. No. <laughs> Stagnite. <laughs> many Germans, and before COVID, many, many Asians, like Japanese people, and uh, also from Korea or China, yeah. uh, but not from Great Britain. No. Well, you know where to go next time you go to Prague. <laughs> and, and, and Thomas, I mean, maybe what, what about the reception of, 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 of Czech music in Switzerland <laughs> uh, that you could tell us about before we move on? I think it's, it's the same everywhere. You hear uh, Voltava, Molda, sometimes, uh, and, but that's about it. Um, I, I've seen, as a teenager, I've seen the part of Pride once, and I can't... I remember um, a part of Mavlast, the first four numbers, never the uh, number five and six, just because they're too historical and people wouldn't understand. Yeah, so that's, that's about it. It's very sad, yeah. yeah. Well, we can um, work at this and we can correct this. Let's, let's go into a completely d different angle um, before we consider aspects of uh, Smetana's life. I think it's fair to say that, uh, and this may surprise some of us, that actually Smetana, well, the Czech, Czech nation has a slightly ambivalent feeling towards Smetana still, mostly due to the politicization um, that, that he un underwent, especially during communist times. Um, he was seen as a very official kind of state figure, um, at least by some people, or promoted as such. And this has maybe not helped his cause there now, which is not to say that people don't love the music of Smetana <laughs> in Prague today and other cities. After all, um, Ostrava has just finished doing all eight of his operas as a cycle, and they're going to repeat them um, in May, which is a, a wonderful achievement. But nevertheless, uh, I think I'll turn to Jan first on this. Um, perhaps you can explain to us where some of this ambivalence might have um, arisen. It's a really long story, and it's a rather murky one, I'm afraid. Um, uh, I was talking to Sandra about this, and uh, we both have our views, but in a way it started in the 19th century. I mean, Smetana had powerful enemies, he had powerful allies, and people always try to create a kind of antagonism, uh, maybe between him and Dvořák, who is the other, uh, you know, headline composer. Not really fair, not really true. Smetana was paranoid towards the end of his life and got rather worried about Dvořák's success. That's one thing. But as we go through the 19th century, things become intellectualized. Never a good idea when it comes to music, I'm afraid. And, you know, that there was this idea that somehow Smetana represented the true branch of Czech opera in particular. There is one extraordinary figure, and I hope we're not in the presence of members of the Zdeniek Needli Appreciation <laughs> Society. Good, no, we're not. Well, um, he uh, made it a kind of personal um, uh, mission in his life to, in a sense, demonstrate Smetana's superiority and Smetana's line through Fibich, Osterchil, first uh, Kovacovic, um, over Dvořák, who he felt was unchecked. Yes, that's uh, intakes of breath. I'm not surprised. Um, this is nonsense, of course. And let's face it, musicology isn't that important. It can't kill people. It can't 
um, make people better. But when it comes to politics, things get very, very nasty indeed. And unfortunately, Naedley became the first Minister of um, Culture and Education in the Communist government from 48, and did his best in a way to uh, follow through his idea that there was a real agenda for Czech music. And I don't think it did Smetana any good, to be honest. He was associated with the establishment. When I first went to Prague as a student in the late 70s, all the friends of my age, um, what should we say, 22, 3, very young, um, uh, really wanted to s sort of stay away from Smetana as the kind of establishment composer. Dvořák was much more appealing. Dvořák was, in a sense, outward looking. All of these things are just interpretation. And I think, to be honest, a lot of nonsense, but it just shows how politics can really do damage to a composer's reputation, um, sometimes for the best of intentions, sometimes for silly ideological ones. But I know Sandra, I'm sure will have views on this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll try not to be too long because I should really start by Bedrich Smetana himself and what he actually wanted at the beginning of uh, 1860s and 70s when he was uh, uh, in Prague uh, uh, in the uh, Provisional Theatre as the uh, first conductor. <coughs> Um, he and, and composer and uh, uh, teacher and he uh, he was doing many things uh, all together um, and uh, uh, he uh, was trying to um, make uh, the Czech culture or high a little bit higher. Uh, in the sense of uh, uh, so that the musicians weren't uh, amateurs, but they, they were professionals. And uh, he was doing it as uh, the conductor in the theater, but he also uh, was trying to find the um, Czech music itself at something, as something which was independent. Uh, because uh, the Czech lands were from the beginning of the 19th century uh, in the uh, Austrian Empire and uh, the German language was the first language which, which was there actually and the Czech nation needed to be uh, uh, independent and, and uh, to know that they have their own uh, distinctive culture. That's what Bedrick Smetana was trying to do uh, also uh, as the composer, because he wanted to show that the Czechs uh, have not uh, only, uh, are not only able to play music very well, but that they are also uh, able to um, think musically in a very good way and that they make very good uh, art. Nayedli after the or in the communist time has taken this idea from Bedrich Smetana and uh, uh, not only Nayadli, it was you know, you know the unfortunately the communist time that I have also lived in uh, so I was a little girl uh, when these things were happening and uh, uh, I was living in a family which was against communists and it meant we don't want communists, we don't want Smetana. Yeah, and uh, the communists wanted to show that they don't need anything which comes from the West. And that's why they have taken Bedrick Smetana as a figure, as a monument, uh, uh, on the contrary to Antonin Dvořák, who was already famous in England and in the United States during his life and afterwards as well. <laughs> Bedrick Smetana wrote Czech um, song, or uh, he wrote also Czech dances, and Antonín Dvořák wrote, uh, wrote uh, Slo Slovenian or uh, Slovak uh, uh, dances. That was what actually uh, Nejedlí would say. How could have Dvořák been uh, the national Czech composer? Uh, when he didn't write things like Bedrick Smetana. So this was actually the feeling in the communist time and it was horrible. <laughs> yeah. I've got a question here, Tomasz, for you in Brno now. Then perhaps you are too, too young a conductor <laughs> to, to feel this, but 
are you aware of this sort of current today? Um, does does any of it linger? Has it ever affected your work, or or do you do you feel absolutely free of any of, of any, uh, any of these, shall we say, prejudices? I think uh, because I I lived uh, almost for twenty years in the communistic part in the communistic period of of, of our history. Uh, I I think I'm very much aware of, of the controversial mm, atmosphere around Smetana. And I think for some reasons, uh, Dvořák was more kind of a typical child of luck. Uh, whatever he did, basically, I mean, I am simplifying, but compared to Smetana, cer certainly. Smetana, in opposite, uh, as you mentioned uh, during his life, he was a subject of controversies and it went on. And now uh, when I go as a conductor somewhere to conduct Smetana, there is always a part of the reaction that criticizes his work and or puts kind of an irony into the reaction. So, for example, uh, uh, having conducted uh, Smetana in a ma one of the major uh, places in Germany, uh, it was Mavlast, uh, the reviews did not forget to say that only the four pieces uh, from Vyšehrad to Sčeský Kluhu Ahayu are good, and Tabor and Blani no more. Because obviously they are uh, not as known. I mean, of course, uh, Vltava number one, then maybe the three others, and uh, Tavor and Blanik really not. Uh, I think they are absolutely on the same genius level as, as the previous movements. And from some point of view, I, I often found Tavor the strongest of the compositions. Uh, uh, this is not yet now to make a competition, but in, in, in terms of, of the intensity of what it, it uh, tries to say. And, yeah, and uh, then, then, you know, the reactions of the press on, on uh, uh, Bartered Bride, uh, again, in one of uh, very important theatres, uh, so very good reactions on the interpretation, but not really. What is this piece? Is it an operetta? For operetta, it's not entertaining and uh, not not pop music like enough. For an opera, it's too much operetta. So what is this? So let's judge it in a very harsh way. And you know, I I I must say that it was sometimes quite painful for me to see that the controversies just go on. If I speak about Smetana with people here, quite often you see them uh, being linked to this tradition of, of uh, like, <laughs> to, to embrace the, the history of a dusty statue of Smetana, rather than a living personality with a living heritage. And uh, uh, for me, I, I must say, there was a way to go from uh, have being linked to the statue of Smetana to the living Smetana. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, can I jump in here quickly regarding this, um, the four uh, pieces of uh, Mavlas that will uh, are usually performed, not Tabor and Blanik. Um, I think it's also because nowadays concerts last about two hours, and when you perf want to perform Mavlast as an entirety, it's 80 minutes of music. What do you do before? What do you do afterwards? It, it, it's, it's difficult to put just a random overture at the beginning and then play Mavlast. Where do you put the interval? It's, People nowadays don't have the t time to yeah. sit for 80 minutes anymore, unfortunately. Miles, you wanted to add 
So I would I will add a, a little bit to Marv last as well. Um, uh, the four uh, pieces from Marv last: Vyšehrad, Vltava, Šárka, and uh, from the uh, Bohemian Fields and uh, Woods uh, have been written uh, in a very short time. And uh, uh, Tabor and Blanik uh, uh, com was composed uh, uh, several years later, and we can hear it a little bit. Yeah, that's 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 actually a very interesting point that uh, that people don't like uh, Tabor and Blanik, uh, and uh, they argue uh, with uh, things that the, that Tabor and Blanik are historically come from the uh, Czech mythology or, or uh, Czech history. Uh, but uh, Vyšehrad and the Šárka came also from Czech mythology and history. Yeah. So this argument doesn't really work. Uh, no, absolutely not. And what I think is interesting, we're talking about the last two movements which were later and came uh, from the period of Smetana's deafness. And I'd like to talk about that for a bit because we've been also seeing the pictures of, of Smetana's ear trumpet uh, being circling there but behind us. Um, and to consider what sort of isolation this might have had on him, whether it perhaps connects him even in some way to Beethoven, and I'll, I'll come to that in, in a moment. Uh, but it's interesting that if you think about the parallels between, say, Beethoven and Goya, who lived very, very parallel lives, and they both went deaf, you could say that the uh, painterly equivalent of a composer would be to go blind, but that would that oversimplifies it really. Both these great figures were isolated from society. And I'd like to ask you a bit more about how perhaps Smetana might have been isolated a little bit towards the end of his life. It was, a, it was a tough life after all. He had, his first wife died tragically young and his second marriage wasn't all that happy. But what I, I think is interesting that if the deafness set in round about 1874, that we have some of the very greatest operas, not the best known operas, but the operas including The Kiss, The Secret, Devil's Ball, these pieces, and the last two movements of Marv Lust. This is all from his period of deafness. And perhaps, Sandra, can you tell us a bit more about that and maybe what effect it had on his music and on his musical personality? No, well, we have un to understand uh, Smetana as the multicultural uh, personality, uh, uh, in that sense that uh, he was not only composer, but he also conducted uh, an orchestra. He was a choir master. He was a teacher. Uh, he was really he was the director of the um, uh, society, which is which was called Umělecká beseda. It was then artistic society, um, uh, which uh, had a musical and uh, um, other. Uh, how to say it. Um, things like art, uh, uh, and uh, he was actually very active in all these things, and uh, he was also very social, and he liked people. He was uh, very uh, happy when when he was uh, uh, in, in the in the middle of uh, the concentrating of uh, everyone. <laughs> Uh, so um, he would be uh, actually very happy here uh, playing the piano for us and, and uh, everybody would, would be clapping the hands and advancement and I would have been very, very happy. And what happened uh, uh, in the summer uh, 1874? Uh, he actually got deaf uh, during four months. And that must have been really very, very depressing. Uh, and. Uh, because before Smetana was doing so many things, he never had so much time to compose as other composers like Martinu, who has never been conducting or things, doing things like that. He was Martinu was just composer, and uh, that's why Martinu has more than 400 pieces, uh, although Smetana has just 150. And in the year 74, uh, he was very brave, what I think, and started to compose very much. So he made something, or he did something, uh, which was in the opposite from what maybe people would do today. Yeah, people would take many antidepressivas, 
and uh, would maybe start to be somewhere in the corner, but Smetana didn't do this. Yeah? He didn't want to move from Prague. Uh, he moved in 76, so it means two years later, or one and a half years uh, after he got death, even though he was not uh, able to conduct and, and to be very uh, active in the, in the cultural life in Prague anymore. Yeah, so, so, this, the, uh, so it was not like that, so that Smetana got deaf and then he was isolated. I don't think so. Yeah, he was trying to be very much in the in the society, but he was not to be. Uh, he was not uh, able to be active in that sense, and that's why he started to compose very much because he was feeling that he was very Czech, and he wanted to give the Czechs uh, a perfect art. Thank you. Let's. Uh do you want to say something? Yeah, uh, can I make the connection to Beethoven and his deafness? Uh, Beethoven went deaf over a very long time per uh, period of time, and uh, even at the end of his life, he was still able to hear high notes and low notes. That's when you listen to Beethoven's late piano sonatas, for example, there's a lot of going on in the higher registers, all very low down, because he could hear that music still very uh, muted. And Smetana couldn't hear anything at all, but Smetana didn't use the piano to compose. He just sat on his desk and wrote the music he heard in his head. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, in a way, if we're thinking of tone poems and Smetana, we should be talking about Liszt. But <laughs> I would like to stick with Beethoven for just a moment longer because, and I think this might be a question for you, Thomas. The, there's in uh, the, the fourth panel of Marvlast from Bohemia's woods and fields, there's, a, there's something, there's a cadence that sounds like a direct quote from the pastoral symphony. You have to really listen out for it, but it appears, and if you're actually concentrating, you would probably hear it. And I don't know whether it's a conscious thing. I mean, certainly Beethoven knew Bohemia and Moravia very well. He visited these places. He stayed at Teplice, Ostrava, I believe. Um, his patron, of course, was the Archbishop of Olomouc. Uh, so there are there are connections, but um, would you say that there is a conscious sort of, shall we say, Beethoven striving about any of Smetana's work? Um, when Smetana started with uh, Josef Proksch in uh, in the, uh, the early 1840s, he studied a lot of um, Beethoven. Uh, Proksch was at that time very um, advanced. Uh, avant-garde almost, so he studied uh, uh, Beethoven, he studied uh, Chopin, early works of Chopin, so he knew what uh, Beethoven was doing or what Beethoven did and obviously music, you've got 12 notes available, you've got cadences, you've got uh, um, but what do you do with these uh, elements you have available in music and so obviously these, these connections are there, yeah. Well, I, I think one thing I, I've never been entirely clear about myself, don't know enough, I, whichever you want to answer this, is his, his period in Gothenburg, we all know he went there um, for um, uh, opportunities, musical opportunities, really. Um, but this is where you might say that his Lystian phase started. It's where he wrote the, the early tone poems, like Richard III and uh, Wallenstein's Come, these pieces. What do you think he really learned there, and indeed, do any of you know particularly what musical life was like in Gothenburg in, in the mid-19th century? Um, yeah, you're lucky, I'm just about to dive into that period of Smetana's <laughs> life. <laughs> um, um, so, Gothenburg was um, a small town uh, in Sweden, there was not much going on, and uh, Smetana got the offer to go there and become a teacher. Uh, so he did a bit of uh, piano lessons and singing lessons, apparently. Um, and uh, Smetana was, before he um, went to Gothenburg, um, he wrote a lot of music in the style of uh, Robert Schumann. He knew Liszt, they were good friends, yeah, or um, a teacher and a pupil, yeah, they became friends. But the connection with Schumann never really work, it didn't click. Um, and uh, after uh, Schumann died in 1856, 
that connection completely uh, vanished. It's uh, it's gone. He he's not interested in the style of Schumann anymore, and he uh, his composition techniques uh, move towards Liszt, and uh, obviously because he talked a lot to Liszt, and he they wrote uh, letters to each other. They met. Uh, he started to write in the style of Liszt. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Now. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I think uh, that he was also uh, very happy about the structure of the symphonic poems, and the, that he wanted to say something with his music. And uh, this uh, um, uh, this kind of uh, um, form, uh, which means uh, that uh, you are actually saying some story in the music, even though the, the music has no words, was something that Smetana was also wanted. Uh, wanted, uh, wanted to try, uh, and uh, uh, after Liszt's symphonic poems, he started to write these ones in uh, in Göteborg, uh, and actually Mavlast uh, is also the cycle of symphonic poems. So by the, uh, in the end uh, of his life, in the last ten years, he came back to to this. Yeah. Thank you. If you want, otherwise. There's plenty of other questions. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. but I, just to say a little bit about um, Göteborg. Um, I think Smetan was quite ambivalent. On the one hand, he was a big fish. He'd felt very underappreciated in Prague. And, and here, you know, he was in charge of many things, had a chance to play chamber music, had a chance to play solo, conduct choirs, conduct orchestras, which was very important to him. He was also felt that it wasn't his place. He felt it was a little bit underlying Philistinism. He really wanted to get back to Prague uh, from many points of view. But the thing I think that's really so extraordinary about Smetana in these years was his kind of radical nature, um, the way in which he could try experimental things that are really crazy. I mean, we were talking about Macbeth and the Witches, the piano piece, it is absolutely wild. Uh, it outlists list from very many points of view. Uh, and similarly, the, the trio in G minor, it's very familiar to us, and yet think about it, the start of it, there's nothing like it from the 1850s, a solo violin line, the way in which that theme transforms throughout it. It's a very, very radical piece. Then, on the other hand, there's also something about Smetana that moderates the radicalism. And I think this is why the symphonic poems are so successful. I, I'm not a huge admirer of Liszt's symphonic poems. Are we? No, perhaps. Um, but <laughs> nevertheless, what I feel with Smetana is he takes Liszt's idea, depiction certainly, but he has a much, much sounder grasp of form. He delivers what he wants to say in a much neater way than Liszt, I'm afraid, could manage in his symphonic poems. And I think that, in the end, is why I think Marvlast overall is such a, a strong work. And just to hark back to all these critics, that uh, Thomas and Tom, you were telling us about. Critics aren't audiences, and I, I really hate the way in which they seem to think they can actually uh, guide their audiences towards some sort of rather superficial dislike of something just because the critic doesn't really agree with it. Forget the critics, just enjoy the music. Yes, I'll, I'll second that. Um, <laughs> um, this is a question I'd also like to ask um, Really, but to all of you, but perhaps we will start with Tomas and Berner, because he doesn't get lonely there. Um, I spend a lot of my time complaining quite loudly about nationalism, at least in its modern forms. And, and people, friends then ask me why so many of the composers I like are often labelled nationalist. To which there's a fairly easy answer, of course, that we talk about 19th century nationalism, which was really, in music, a protest against imperial domination. I mean, it's a simplification, but a lot of the composers we're talking about come under that, that heading. So I wondered if we could think in the context of Smetana, but more generally, what makes the composer national? And why Smetana, and, and this is a, a simplification, a misleading label, but nevertheless, there's some truth to it if he's called, you know, the, the father of um, Czech opera. It's not really, it's not really true. But um, it's a useful label, it's a way, it's a, it's a label that's also applied to his contemporaries, 
like Moniuszko in Poland and Erkel in Hungary. All these wrote lots and lots of wonderful operas that, on the whole, and in the case, uh, excepting the case of Bart Bride, in Smetner's case, haven't travelled all that well. So they, they remain national composers, they remain the, the fathers or whatever of those operatic traditions. And maybe, Tomasz, do, do you see Smetner really as a national composer or is that all last century or indeed the century before? I think uh, music itself is such an open and sensitive language that m music, if it would be a person who would talk to us today, it would say probably that uh, music does not really like any kind of ism, nationalism, uh, ideology. I think music is much more open language which goes beyond words and certainly beyond any political systems and, and ideas and uh, competition for power. And I think this is so important uh, because, because as we said, uh, it's, uh, I mean, uh, Mavlas is so easy to be used for purposes that are maybe, yeah, not not really as clean as the music is. I uh, and I think that uh, you know this is my very personal view, because of course Smetana did not uh, write any article about it. But uh, Mavlas is a piece that praises a history of one nation sings about the history, but basically does not glorify the history. Because if you if you think about Sharka, I mean, we know it's not a history, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, just a saying, so, it's, 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 uh, it's a story, but not history. But, you know, Sharka does not give such a positive view on, <laughs> on uh, the uh, peaceful Czech nation, if we would like to have this, or uh, Tabor, you know, it's a very conflicting music. So it's not one colored music. It it just says uh, if it if it says something about about this national idea, it says there is this history. There 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 are these people. Let's. Let's sing about it, let's play about it, but uh, it's not a political statement. For me as a conductor, if I study every note of, of this piece, even in the, and we, I mean, we probably should touch the opera Dalibor. Again, about opera Dalibor, there is a big m mythical atmosphere until now that Dalibor, you know, is the example of the fantastic Czech knight of, of, this, of, this, of this hero of Czech history. I mean, if you follow the words what Dalibor is singing, he is a bloody violent guy. And uh, so there is a lot of positive about him, a lot of beautiful, but it's not a, it's not a cartoon, it's much more serious. So I would really love Smetana to be discovered as a very modern composer and a very modern uh, musical language of that time going into our time. Thank, thank you, Tomasz, for uh, such a nice point of view uh, uh, as a conductor, because you really feel music and you love music and you talk about it. I have to say something about uh, uh, the history, uh, because I'm the musicologist. So from the, uh, from the historical point of view, uh, there were reasons why Bedrich Smetana was uh, choosing these themes, like Czech mythology. It came from the National Revival, 
uh, which was uh, very important in the 19th century to show that the Czech uh, nation has something uh, which uh, belongs only to the Czech nation and that's why the Czech uh, mythology like Dalibor or Libuše or Vyšehrad or Šárka, the, all these st stories uh, which are actually sometimes, as Tomáš said, uh, like a detective stories, yeah. Uh, they, uh, it, it, it came from chronicles uh, and uh, in the 19th century it was very modern to use these themes to show that the Czech nation is independent. And that's why Bedřich Smetana has also been choosing these themes in operas or in symphonical uh, pieces also for, for his music and uh, this is one of the reasons why later on have people started to, to uh, um, call him national composer. So it had not very much to do with the music itself but with the themes that Smetana has been choosing to show that the Czech nation is independent. I couldn't agree more with everything that's been said. Uh, there's so much nonsense talked about nationalism and Czech composers, uh, Dvořák, Smetana, all of them. Um, but we can leave... Uh, Smetana lets us out with a wonderful <laughs> approach that he had, and it's to do with the biggest row he ever had, ascetic row he ever had in his life, and this was with a politician called Jan Ladislav Riga, who said, well, you must start putting folk songs into your operas, then the audience can join in. Can you imagine a sing-along night at the Provisional Theatre? How, what fun that would be. And Smetana's view was, in essence, you can stick f as many folk songs as you like in a piece till you're blue in the face. It doesn't create a work of art. That was where he was coming from, fundamentally. <laughs> John, you were talking about uh, Beatrice Smetana as the father of the Czech uh, opera. Yes. So just two sentences about this. Uh, when Beatrice Smetana was uh, in, at the beginning of 60s in Prague, uh, he was uh, for one year working as a musical reviewer. Uh, and he was reviewing... A critic. Critic, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And he was reviewing operas. And uh, so this uh, uh, brought to, to him uh, very much in the sense that he knew the repertoire of the Provisional Theatre very good. And he started to be the first conductor uh, in 1866 and he was also uh, uh, trying to um, uh, be the one who actually wants to bring another new operas into the repertoire because there were no Czech operas, there were no Slovan operas. Uh, there were just operas Italian, French, uh, etc. So he wanted also to invent a Czech opera and that's why he started to write operas. He actually learned Czech because of this, because he was brought up in German, yeah, and I mean in, in the German language. And uh, so as uh, the beginning uh, when he was um, a little bit more than 40 uh, years old, he actually started to learn uh, to write and read Czech. Uh, and he, he did it not only for himself to, to be able to write letters in Czech, because he was able to write them in German, uh, but uh, he wanted to, to learn Czech to be uh, able to compose in the Czech language and to invent the Czech opera. Thank you. I mentioned a moment ago how the Bart of Bride seems to stand apart from all of Smetana's other operas, in other words, as The Bart of Bride, and then the, the other seven, which don't generally get done very much outside of the Czech Republic. Um, and I wondered if any of you could address this for a moment. I mean, one theory one might have is that it, it sort of became, The Bart of Bride became an honorary German opera, as Die Kauf der Braut, when it was done not far away in Vienna, say, with, with German names replacing the, the original uh, the, the original characters' names. So there's that aspect that it it does feel as if it stands apart. It's internationally loved. The music is is hard to resist, I must say. But more recently, I've begun to feel that maybe the Czechs have a slight problem with Bart Bride. It's an opera that turns up in some very odd productions. The, the most recent one 
in, in Prague, to put it decidedly in inverted commas, and it had multiple Marzhenkas. Um, any of you able to summarize the position of Bart of Bride vis-a-vis -vis the rest of Smetna's operas? Well, uh, I'm sorry to talk too much tonight. No, <laughs> um, uh, Betsy Smetana uh, has uh, left still uh, when it was the hundreds uh, performance of Prodana Nevesta of the Barter Bride. It was uh, in 1882 and he was already completely deaf but he was of course at this event and after that he said Prodana Nevesta is actually a toy my friends. I wrote it because they called me a Wagnerian composer. Um, this is very interesting, actually, yeah, because Prodana Vesta is really very dif different from the other Smetana's operas. Maybe Hubička is a little bit uh, um, uh, similar. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that what we were talking about, the themes, uh, these themes like Libuše, Dalibor, Braniboři v Čechách, the Brandenburgers in Bohemia, these themes are very rigid, Regional, yeah. Uh, but Prodana uh, Nevesta is a story from the village, the story about love, the story that everyone understands. And that's why, not only because it has a genial music, but also because everyone all over the world, also in Japan, understand the story between two people who love each other and someone who ha wanted to uh, how do you say that make make it bad <laughs> yeah so so i think that uh, that was the first uh, uh, reason for Brodana Nevesta had such a big success even though the success was not uh, abroad uh, during smetana's life because smetana has uh, made four uh, different uh, versions of uh, uh, the Bartered Bride uh, during his life. He wanted uh, 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 at the beginning of the uh, 70s um, uh, to get uh, Brodana Neviesta into Paris because he thought that uh, the opera um, life in Paris is actually something which is the best in the world. But he didn't succeed. Uh, and uh, in Petrohrad uh, in 71, uh, it was a fiasco. Uh, so uh, he was not very happy about what happened to Prodana Neviesta abroad, but uh, after his death uh, in uh, 1892, uh, when the National Theatre went uh, with Prodana Neviesta to Vienna, it was uh, an absolute triumph. Thank you. I'd like to, if possible, raise one or two other questions briefly. Um, did you, uh, Tomas? Did you want to say something there? Yeah, just 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 a very very small small uh, 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 additional thought. Uh, I, I agree with what, of course with what was said, but um, uh, I think uh, the problem of Prodana Neviesta's interpretation in Czech Republic has been that uh, the stagings in the past decades, almost all of them looked like the same, because everybody expected the same, like an entertaining evening with uh, people being traditionally dressed, you know, a little naive village. So lots of, lots of productions looked very, very similar. I think it's a very hard thing to, to make it uh, work uh, for our time, I, I think it's it's a big big invitation for fantastic stage directors, and uh, uh, I think the same is about about the the music because the combination of styles in this opera, because it's uh, in, in some moments it's a Czech version of opera buffa. <laughs> uh, the the uh, singing of Ketzal, the trios, quartets there with the parents and then in the third act you have this beautiful area of Marzenka, of Mary, <coughs> said internationally, 
that speaks a language uh, which could be again attacked as Wagnerian. I must say I don't very much agree with labeling Smetana like this. But to, 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 to embrace the spirit of Baden Bright. So, you know, it's not that difficult to conduct it, like to, to make it work, but to embrace the real quality, the, the real uh, sensitiveness of, the, of this music. Wow. Yeah. This, is, this is really difficult. Thank you. I would like to raise a couple of other things briefly, but really the point now in a moment will be to open the floor to questions from you, so please feel, feel free. But before we do that, there's one thing, and perhaps you'll indulge me for a moment, if any of you can help me with this question. That is, two of the composers with, with, with about, I just could not live without, are Smetana and Martineau. And somehow I feel there's a, there's a connection between them that's quite hard to pin, pin down. Uh, I don't think uh, Martinu could have happened without Smetana, um, and you wouldn't fi you wouldn't say that necessarily about Dvorak. It's a very vague thought, but I don't know if if any of you could address that. I feel there's a a connection there. Thank you. That's a tough one. Um, I I think a lot of it is down to where their music came from. If you think of Bartered Bright Runner Neviesta. It grew out of the repertoire of this very, very small theatre which loved tightrope walkers, it loved um, acrobats of various kinds, it liked vaudeville, and it liked, um, uh, you know, sort of slightly musical kind of entertainment. And I think the success of The Bartered Bride early on was a lot down to that because it was responding readily to audiences. Now think about Martinu and his operas. They are so much, they grow so much out of theatrical tradition of that sort of kind. He was not a Wagnerian in any sense. He was not a kind of thumping nationalist of any kind. He actually wanted to see what was done in medieval drama, in, in folk drama of various kinds. I think that's maybe where... Cinema and film as well. And cinema and film, you know, sort of uh, t t taking your inspiration from, um, you know, unashamedly popular sources. Um, Martino was like a sponge. Uh, he he was uh, um, he didn't have a teacher in the uh, composing. He was uh, uh, learning himself, uh, and uh, so he was taking many um, uh, composers uh, as uh, his own uh, uh, predecessors, uh, and uh, uh, Smetana was one of them. Uh, uh, at the beginning, Martino would have never said that, yeah. Uh, but, uh, for example, in uh, 1928, uh, when uh, it was the triumph of uh, Prodana Nevesta in, in Paris, Martino was living in Paris at that time, and he wrote such a beautiful article about Smetana and about his uh, Bartered Bride in Paris. Uh, and when we see this text, we can really uh, imagine how much he actually uh, was some, uh, going from the Smetana's music or how much he loved his music. Thank you. No, I think, I, f I feel bad because we've dwelt a lot on the tone poems and the operas and we've ho ho scarcely mentioned the piano music. In fact, we've not mentioned the string quartets, <laughs> the two string quartets, which are, uh, again, absolutely wonderful. Um, but we also have talked about the music and not so much about the words. And I, I have a question perhaps for Thomas if he can help us with this one or any of you and this is about um, the librettist Eliska Krasnohaska who gets overlooked at least by people outside <laughs> of Czech music and, and the Czech Republic she wrote the librettos for several of his late operas and she was a very important feminist writer um, she, she founded the first gymnasium for girls in the whole of the Austro-Hungarian Empire she translated Adam Miskevich, the great Polish poet's epic poem, Pan Tadeusz, into Czech for the first time. She was a remarkable personality, and yet uh, we don't hear much about her. I don't know if Thomas or any of you are well-versed in, in her and can help. Not that much. I'd rather pass on the microphone to somebody else, but if you would 
want to come back to the piano music. Yes, please. please. All right, please. <laughs> I like the trumpet. Just a quick word about uh, Krasnohorska. I mean, she was one of the most intellectually gifted um, figures of her generation, I think, and one of the most interesting articles she ever wrote, quite short. 1871, she said, Czech composers, none of you know how to set Czech. You get the accent wrong all the time. Uh, Czech is downbeat and yet you constantly make it upbeat. And she gave some very, very simple, but very clear examples of how you should set check. And what happened after that? They all got much better in a period of about two years. She supplied Smetana with his libretti. Dvořák almost overnight improved no end in the way he set check with proper downbeats, not hitting the final syllable of words. Very clever woman. Well, let's um, hear it for the piano music uh, briefly, and then we will open uh, this discussion to the floor. Uh, yes, uh, as we know, Smetana wrote uh, a lot of piano music early on because he, ne he needed the music to perform, as you said earlier. He, well, uh, he wanted to become a, he wanted to be on the stage, but in the end, he didn't like it that much anymore because it was quite painful for him to be on stage and. Um, uh, but it was a way of making a living. Um, and uh, when he um, went to Gothenburg, he kind of stopped writing uh, music for the piano. And later on, uh, when, it's, uh, when he was uh, the, uh, conductor at the theater, he didn't write any piano music at all because he was just too busy all the time. He was uh, writing for the newspaper. He was a conductor. He there was a lot of admin work to do as well, so we uh, shouldn't forget about that. And he was writing his operas. And then after he became deaf, he started to write the piano music again, very intimate, something for himself again. Mm -hmm. so just well, that's a beautiful note to end on. Um, questions, please. Now, does Slovakia make any claims to Smetana? <laughs> Does Slovakia make any claims to Smetana? <laughs> it's a good question. What happened to Slovakia? <laughs> I, I, I would imagine they just enjoy the music very much. <laughs> it doesn't belong to them. <laughs> I think Slovakia makes many claims about the Czech nation. <laughs> Um, I'd like to bring up the subject of the first string quartet um, because I, I find the moment of that high tone coming in which indicated his deafness is devastatingly moving. Um, can any of you tell me exactly um, if we know the physical effect of the deafness? I mean, could he hear high things to the end of his life? What was it like? I mean, we don't know fully, but... Perhaps we could hear a bit more about that. Yeah, at a bit, uh, as far as I know, so at the beginning, uh, in, in the letter he mentions it as like a white noise he hears of, uh, of the, uh, the tinnitus he had. And later on, I think he mentioned it's something like, a, uh, so in the string quartet it's a high E, but um, it's E4, yes. But in, a, in one of his letters he's, uh, he said, uh, I'm hearing an, e, an A flat major chord in the first inversion. If you would have a piano around here, I would play it up for you. Uh, so, but it's, um, I myself have a tinnitus on my, my left ear, and it's quite disturbing because you hear it constantly. And as a composer, if you try to write music in a different key than A flat major, then it's very disturbing. Yeah. It must have been very, very uh, painful for him. Oh, um, he actually heard more tones, not only E4. Uh, we don't know how many, but uh, he was uh, writing in his letters that uh, he also uh, heard um, s um, people talking and, uh, and, and many things uh, that he actually had in his head and he heard it all the time and it was disturbing him very much and it was also not giving him very, uh, or making him very happy. Uh, so that, that's why he also had uh, some problems uh, uh, by the end of his uh, life, uh, because uh, uh, he was actually disturbed all the time. 
with something which was in his hearing, but it was just in himself. And uh, he wrote in a letter to his uh, librettist as well that she should reduce the numbers of ensembles in his operas because he struggled writing ensembles like quartets and, and so on. Uh, because you've got so many lines uh, going on, and so he was, uh, yeah, it was quite difficult for him. Don't forget, you can also ask questions to our conductor in Verano. Um, could you please elaborate on the other string quartet, which is very seldom played, and to me, in many parts, sound like by some other composer, I would never have put Smetna there, but maybe that's my own ignorance. I think you're right. It's a very, very different work. It was written uh, very much towards the end of his life. He claimed he had difficulty concentrating. And it's, as you, I'm sure, know, it's very episodic from many points of view. It seems to me that it's actually looking beyond. He's maybe going back to that radicalism I mentioned that actually looks rather beyond um, the string quartet's convention of the day to something much later. Um, guess who really liked it? Schoenberg. Yeah. He, he was a great admirer of that piece, and I think in many ways it looks even towards Janáček, uh, towards the Janáček quartet. It, it is so personal, and there's something so uh, visceral about the musical language in it that I, uh, I, I feel it is stepping out of his immediate environment. It is very different uh, from the first uh, string quartet and Madonna um, uh, was uh, also criticized for this, uh, not during his life but afterwards, uh, that, uh, that there were actually two te uh, theories about the string quartet. One of them was that he was already uh, having problems and that's why he didn't write such a nice music as a first string quartet. Uh, and the other theory was that he was looking forward and uh, uh, or, uh, or in the future uh, in the sense of harmonic structure as well and not only, uh, uh, as Jan said, uh, the short uh, um, uh, musical ideas that, that Smetana used there. Yeah, and and uh, uh, the, his compositional style of the second string quartet is also a little bit similar to uh, the last opera, Certova Stena. So th this means that he really was probably uh, uh, looking into the future uh, with these two pieces. Tomas. If I may just one, one, one sentence. Uh, I think uh, for me as a musician, it's amazing to look at the way how he seemed to uh, go towards dissonant harmonies and uh, uh, in, in the in the Devers Wall, Certo Bastiona, in his last opera, uh, you have some very modern modern sounding chords for that time, and I think the same for for the string quartet. I think uh, one one of the things that that uh, is very essential for Smetana's interpretation, and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, whenever I hear the, the second string quartet, I feel in this very much is how sensitive it is to, uh, to find the right shape, the right tempo relations, uh, uh, right articulation, of, uh, so that uh, the, the score really sounds as, as much as, 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 as good as it can. And I think now, and having been in, in, in Opera Dalibor, uh, uh, it's a completely different music, but I think there is something about Smetana that, that the, the musicians need to think about, and this is tempo. And this is for the chamber music, and it's not as obvious and as simple as it may seem. And I have a question for uh, Tomasz. We have seen some tantalizing pictures of Dalibor from, uh, from Brno. So could you tell us a bit more about your collaboration with Sir David Poultney, please? Yes. Uh, so uh, we did it together with uh, David Pountney, uh, which is which is an artist who did so many Czech operas in in his life, and uh, I think uh, uh, it it was clear that when when if he does this piece, 
it uh, can uh, bring some controversies very clearly and Dali war all of us brings them uh, because uh, for some reasons uh, uh, Dalibor is maybe the most sensitive of Smetana's opera for staging and I remember even in the 1990s after the political change uh, the, the famous Czech uh, director Miloš Forman uh, was supposed to do it in Prague and he suggested some changes quite massive changes and uh, then he, he withdraw from the production because the reaction was just so bad, so difficult. <laughs> uh, so uh, there are two things. Uh, Dalibor is an opera that, uh, although the music is very deep and, uh, you know, some people would say Wagnerian, I'm not saying this, I think it's Smetana. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I can tell you that, that m m my children, who have heard a lot of operas with me, said but it sounds like a pop music of that time. The motifs are so sweet, so fantastic, so easy to memorize, that one could just walk out and sing them. Not of all of them, but yeah. Uh, the, the production is... Uh, a little bit timeless visually. I mean, this would be more for David Pountney to say. I will just say very shortly that uh, it, it's a it's it's a production that reflects uh, not the historical uh, story, not not the historical historical uh, view of Dalibor, but but it's it's a modern production. Uh, I think uh, it already did. Uh, awake a lot of controversies which I think for our period of time are important and uh, healthy and also important to invite uh, all generations of people, not only the ones who, who want to hear just Dalibor and forget it. There was an article um, appeared a few years ago about the examination of Smetana's skull and the, um, uh, the the theory was that the, uh, it revealed some bone infection which he might have uh, acquired in his teenage years and that this might account for his later collapse of health. Um, I just wonder, is that an accepted or what's, what's the current state of opinion on all that? Well, yeah, yes, this is one of the theories uh, uh, of what was the reason uh, why he actually got deaf when he was uh, uh, older. Uh, he, it, it happened when he was 10 and he was uh, uh, playing with other boys uh, um, with uh, um, uh, gum powder, yeah, and which was uh, in the glass. And uh, it just didn't come out, so he went to watch what happened and so he was the first who actually got because it just came out when when he was very close and he and he had glass uh, pieces in his uh, uh, face uh, and because it happened by the uh, uh, pond uh, the boys brought water from the pond and, and were, were trying to <laughs> wash it with this horrible water full of uh, things that came from fields. And so uh, the, the theory is that he actually got infected uh, and that he didn't hear uh, uh, for two weeks uh, on the right uh, ear, uh, which he, he couldn't say to his father because he would kill him. Uh, um, and uh, uh, he had uh, all his uh, life problems uh, with this right uh, part of uh, of his face, and so th this is one of the theories why why he actually got deaf uh, when he was uh, uh, older. Uh, but he actually, uh, by the end, when he died, he died uh, for pneumonia. So it was the reason of his his death. Well, I think that's a suitably gory note um, <laughs> on which to end, and I would really just like to thank these, this wonderful panel for being here tonight and all of you for being a, a wonderful audience. Thank you very much.